Ship and bought the blob from uh, students back in 2007. Uh, Mary Margaret is one of the uh, most well-known recruiters in the Netherlands and in the U US of A and the old the old game industry, which all started around Silicon Valley and UK uh, and Japan, of course. Uh, Mary Margaret has worked in UK as well. She has a website called MaryMargaret.com, which is a big network on recruitment, and she's basically dedicated her whole life to helping other people find a really cool job and keeping it. Right? In the game industry. Yes. So, Mary Margaret, a uh, warm applause for Mary Margaret. Great. Well, we're hoping that my email that I sent to myself with my notes will show up. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. There's a lot of people here today. Okay, so promise me one thing. Everything I tell you, you're going to tell somebody else, right? Spread the word. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so JP probably already told you I started in the video games industry uh, over 20 years ago. I started in 1993, or excuse me, 1991, and uh, I had just finished graduate school and there were no jobs. And I went to graduate school because I'd finished college and there were no jobs. And so when I hear people talking about, oh, jobs for graduates, jobs for graduates, it's a terrible thing. I'm like, there weren't any jobs when I graduated. But I want to make sure that there are jobs, especially in the games industry, for you guys. And making sure that you are the most prepared that you can possibly be. So unfortunately, um, it's a little blurry, but I like to put my lifetime membership of the IGDA because I was charter member of the IGDA. And uh, it sort of shows how committed I am to the games industry. My husband also works in the game industry. We worked, uh, excuse me, we met each other at a conference at E397 in Atlanta. And uh, we're pretty committed to the industry for life. So, and that goes on to say that obviously this is one of my favorite songs and all of a sudden everybody's talking about this song. So. I liked it first. Uh, the game industry is my home. They talk a lot about burnout and people who don't manage their careers long term so that they're not looking for another industry to move into five to seven years later. And that's about the time that most people burn out, it's about five to seven years. So the, the, the goal is to, is to be in charge of your career and plan it out, know what you want, know what you're doing, so that if this is truly where you want to be, this is your home. Again, this is me at the beginning and uh, crazy times in Austin, Texas. I don't know if you guys know, uh, if you guys ever played any of the Ultima series, Ultima Online. I started out at Origin Systems as a designer a million years ago. <clears throat> so let's get to it. That's interesting. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about maintaining your successful career in the games industry. And this is basically the whole point of why we're here. You are your own brand. You're no, longer, you're no longer just somebody who works for a company. You're your own personal brand these days. And I think, I don't even think I have to explain it to you. Generations before you, they expected to stay employed with the same company for the majority of their lives. These days, uh, staying with a company three to four years is good. Staying with the company for seven years is pretty stellar. You don't want to stay with the company, sadly to say, you don't want to stay with the company more than 10 years unless this is your dream. This is your company or this really is your company. You're building it. But you need to make sure that you're staying current and you're staying fresh and your salary is where it should be and you're being value, uh, you're valuable as well as being a value add 
you're bringing value to the company. So you have to evaluate all of those things throughout the course of working with each company, which is why so many people spend three to four years with each company. Now, I have a lot of people that come to me, one guy in particular who's been in the game industry as long as I have, and his resume has a string of jobs that are less than two years long. That's a killer. That's an absolute killer. Now, if you have, um, if you have a situation where you've been laid off or something like that, and in between a couple of jobs, you've got a short stint, not a big deal. But you want to you want to show that you're in it for the long haul, even if you are moving around for upward mobility, and that again goes back to being your own CEO. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about tips on. We're going to talk about what's different today, because it seems like every year. There's something new that I have to be aware of, that I have to tell you, that's brand new information. Uh, tell me, for example, did any of you know that the majority of, from the smallest company to the largest company, the majority of uh, companies are accepting resumes through a software system, and if your resume doesn't have the right amount of keywords to the job description, that a person doesn't actually ever see your resume. Who knew that? Okay, not very many of you. Who knows that you need to uh, now, at a different time it wasn't so much the case, it was always a good idea to, to change your resume for each position, but now you really have to because you have to pull out words and phrases from the job description and put them into your resume for each job you apply for. Who knew about that? Okay, that's good. So we're going to talk about things like that, what's different, tips on when you aren't looking, and tips on when you are looking, and these days, really, what's the difference? And then I'm going to go through a resume overview. And lastly, I'm going to talk about where we're going and how we will get there. And obviously, I have a typo. Not a good idea. And I have no idea why when you aren't looking is missing its, uh, its little... Ah, okay. Sorry. Never mind. They're over here. Uh, <clears throat> so bear in mind that what we're going to talk about now is that when you aren't looking and when you are looking... There's really no difference anymore. Absolutely no difference. You are the only person who can define your goals. You have to know what your skills and aptitudes are. You have to know what you're good at, what you enjoy, what kind of companies you want to work for. Uh, do you see yourself in a small company or a large company? All of these things are the, they're, they're, they're things that only you can answer. And I get questions all the time asking me to answer those questions for the person that's coming to me. And I have to turn it back around on them and I have to say, I can't answer those questions. You have to answer those questions. And it's, it's a searching process and it's, not, it's a lifelong searching process and it's not an easy process. But if you want a fulfilling career, you're going to define your goals and you're going to reach them. But if you let somebody else define your goals, if you let somebody else build your path, if you let somebody else tell you where to go, you're not going to be happy where you go. So again, I think everybody knows that you always have to be prepared with an elevator pitch. Very short, what have you been doing? What do you want to do? Who are you? What do you want to be? Uh, What's your goal in life? If somebody talks to you tomorrow and says, I've got the dream job for you, you want to be able to tell them in 45 seconds or less what makes you wonderful. Oops. I think it's important to always be building a list of accomplishments. And the next slide, it talks about keeping your resume fresh. Well, these days, Again, 
You have to keep your resume fresh at all times. Right now, I have more passive candidates coming to me than probably ever before. Just within the last 18 months, I have, I started having hundreds of people coming to me on a monthly basis, signing into my database, and they were perfectly happily employed. And that's what we call a passive candidate. An active candidate is somebody who's actively looking for a job because they're unemployed or they've just been, uh, just been out of school, something like that. So passive candidates, it's great to be a passive candidate, but you can't be a passive candidate and not have an updated resume. So I talk about list of accomplishments. I think through the year, you want to write down things that happen to you, and you also want to write down things that you've, the way you're feeling when they happen. So that when you are updating your resume, and right now, you want to update your resume every six months, if not more often. Uh, you want to capture the things that you've written down on this, on this paper where you've written down your list of accomplishments and remember those feelings so you can be as prolific as you want to be, be as prolific as you want to be when you write your resume, and then pull back, and then edit out. But the hardest thing I have when somebody comes to me with a resume is it doesn't have enough information. It doesn't have enough description about what they've done, and the, the excitement isn't there. I'll, I'll get two blurbs, and I'll say, really? No, tell me more about this. Why were, you, why were you pleased? And when you keep that kind of list of accomplishments, keep those feelings, you remember how you felt when you did that. Updated resume and social network profiles. Um, this is critical. And this is where my notes come in, but I don't think they're going to show up for me. So we'll just wing it. Um, these days, you hear a lot about social media experts, social media marketing. Well, great. That's a job. That's a job title. That's a whole field. That's, that's a business. That's a company. But guess what? It's also you as an individual representing your personal brand on the internet every day you're interacting with other people. So you want to make sure that you are focusing on a couple of really good social networks, the ones where you're going to find the majority of your peers. For me, it's been, it's been Facebook and LinkedIn that are two, the two most important to me. Google Plus, we'll see if that actually turns out to be anything. I play on Google Plus because it's there. But I play on a lot of things. But, you know, Instagram, all of these other places, uh, they're great. But that's not where you're going to meet people that are going to hire you. <clears throat> when you're um, interacting on these social networks or whether you are meeting somebody face to face, you always want to be ready to listen to new opportunities. Listening to a new opportunity does not mean that you're disloyal to what you're doing or your company or anything like that. I'm not encouraging you to quit your job. Absolutely not encouraging you to quit your job. I'm encouraging you to be your own CEO. I'm encouraging you to be in charge of your life, in charge of your career, and to make decisions as opportunities come before you and be aware of what's out there. That's the most important thing, being aware of what's going on out there, being aware of, like right now in the U.S., uh, I've got two clients, and just in the last six weeks, the market on engineers has tightened dramatically. And that happens every once in a while. For the last eight months, I could find anybody you needed. Last six weeks, all of a sudden, boom, can't find anybody. So you want to know, are you of high value right now or not? And you want to be able to have enough of an awareness that with a couple of quick questions or a couple of Google searches or something like that, you can be up to date on what's been happening in the last two months. Always be ready to listen to new opportunities. And again, within your organization or outside your organization, if somebody takes you aside in your organization, they want to talk to you about a new opportunity, 
and you think your lifelong dream is to be an artist and you don't ever want to be an art director, why would you tell them that before you've listened to what they have to say? Why would you, not saying that you have to take the job, but you should listen. Think about it. Look at the skill set. Look at your aptitudes. Look at what you want to do. Look at where you want to go. Listen to the opportunity. Stay educated. This is critical. And this goes back to, if, if I haven't gotten it across to you yet, the biggest drive behind everything I'm telling you is personal responsibility. You are in charge of your career. This is your personal responsibility. It's your responsibility to stay educated throughout your entire career. It's not okay to learn what you've learned and to be comfortable with the skill sets that you have and go into a job and wait until somebody bothers to put a training program in front of you for the next thing. You want to be reading about it. You want to know what's going on. You want to stay educated and you want to stay trained. You want to be looking for opportunities to learn about the next thing. Stay active in the industry outside your job. Now, I don't want to overwhelm you with all of this because the point of this is not that you have to 24 hours a day work on your career. This will actually be natural as you begin to do it. If you're part of a couple of different industry organizations and you meet people in one once every quarter and in one once every month, fantastic. I'm not talking about every week you have to go out and go to a mixer. I'm just saying stay active outside the industry, um, or excuse me, stay, outside, stay active outside of your job in the industry. And, and really that comes down to, to meeting fresh people. Don't burn bridges. <clears throat> this is obvious. And this is about uh, when you aren't looking and you are thinking about looking and you're getting exasperated, make sure that what you're doing as you're exiting or as you're thinking about exiting your company or thinking about looking for another job, that you're not burning bridges in the process. Pretty obvious. Uh, I personally think that one of the best ways to further your own goals and personal fulfillment is to mentor, being one and having one. It's amazing how much when you're teaching somebody else, you actually learn as well because as you try to explain something from your perspective and you try to understand it from their perspective, you might get fresh ideas about where you want to go. I love this comedian that talked a long time ago about when uh, adults ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, they're not interested. They're actually looking for ideas. And the whole point is your path is in front of you. So when you're mentoring, you're helping somebody. You're, you're, I always think of life as a ladder and your work career as a ladder. So you've got your hand down. You're helping somebody up. But guess what? They're helping you too. <clears throat> And then we've talked about personal branding and personal presentation. And that's everything from being careful about how you represent yourself online, making sure that even though the environment is casual, that, uh, that you respect the communities that you become a part of and that you don't fall for uh, a casual environment means that you start talking about things that aren't appropriate in that environment. You need to take, take, take the opportunity to participate in the environment, but assess the group that you're talking to. Always, always remember that wherever you're talking is about your personal brand. So on Facebook, for example, I'm very personal on my public page about my life, but I still, don't take, I still don't tell things that are so personal I don't want anyone to know. I share things that I feel are comfortable share, that I feel I'm comfortable sharing. I don't talk about politics. I don't think it's appropriate for me to be talking about politics on my public page. It's not what people come to my page to talk about. They, talk, they come to my page to have fun, laugh at me, laugh at other people, learn about careers, learn about job openings. 
they don't uh, uh, they don't come to talk about politics. So again, there's really no difference, and I'm going to speed through this as quickly as I can. When you are looking, you always want to have your resume updated and be sure that all your social network profiles are updated. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. When I when I work with somebody in a in a consulting one-on-one -on -one relationship where I'm giving them career consulting, one of the first things I'll do is I'll go see how many profiles they have in LinkedIn. And this is less likely for you guys, but sometimes I've seen it happen with students and with people who are uh, maybe five, 10 years in the industry, they will have created a LinkedIn profile and they'll forgotten about it. And then two or three years later, or maybe six months later, they'll create another LinkedIn profile. And so when I go look for you, I find two people. And the first thing I want to know is how come you're not familiar enough with your own profile on your website, or excuse me, on the internet, that you don't know that you have two LinkedIn profiles and you haven't, you haven't deleted one and, and whether or not this, the primary one is up to date. So update your resume, social network profiles. Stay in charge of your search regardless of outside help. I don't care who's helping you, whether it's an internal recruiter or an external recruiter, it's your job. It's your job search. Their job is not to help you figure out what your job is to do next. Their job is to fill the position that they've been hired to fill. If they are working internally, they report to the company, and at the moment that you are not appropriate for any of the jobs that they have open, they don't need to be working with you. If you're working with a recruiter, it's the same deal. If they don't have any job openings that match what you're looking for, they don't need to be working with you. So <clears throat> you have to stay in charge and you have to stay in charge and make sure that you're not surrendering the responsibility of your job search to somebody else. Um, keep working and keep, uh, keep your experience fresh. I always tell people if they're unemployed or if they've been laid off, something like that, at the very worst, if they're having trouble finding a job, go find a company and volunteer for anywhere from, you know, five hours a month to 10 hours a week, whatever you've got. You can put it on your resume. It's skills that you've, it's skills that you've acquired. Frankly, it's nobody's business whether you've been paid or not. And, uh, <clears throat> It's an opportunity as well to gain skills that are missing from your resume that might move you forward into the job that you want next. Always keep working and always keep your experience fresh. Don't ever put a resume in front of somebody that has your last job was uh, nine months ago or a year ago. What have you been doing since then? Um, apply only to jobs that are right for you. I have, I have people sign into my website and they say, uh, can you just send me to the companies that want to work that, that I, that I'm a fit for? And I say, no, same deal. It's not my responsibility and I can't possibly know just how much of an expert they are in any one of the requirements for the job opportunity. I can't decide for them whether they want to work for that particular company. It's your decision. So when I have people that come to me with those kinds of questions, I push it back on them. You're responsible for your own career. Uh, you may have heard this before, but when you're interviewing potential employers, um, when when employ intention, excuse me, when you're interviewing with potential employers, make sure that you are interviewing them while they are interviewing you, as it's appropriate, as the conversation leads in that direction. Ask them questions. Why do you like working here? What do you want to do in 10 years? You know, what, what drove you to come to this company? Why, uh, why is this company so great? Don't be afraid to ask those questions that actually makes you look interested. It makes you uh, more interesting to the company because you've obviously engaged at the level that you want to know why they should why you should work with them at the same time they're trying to figure out why they should be working with you. Again, be cautious whether it's online or in person when the conversation turns casual. Uh, 
this is this is the worst nightmare is that um, sometimes it's been known to happen where the group that's interviewing you will take you out to lunch and they'll start ca talking casually and somebody will say something to somebody else about, oh, I'm having such a hard time finding um, childcare. And next thing you know, you're telling them the same thing. Well, you've just told them that you don't, you're not reliable to show up for work. And they haven't asked you if you have children and they haven't asked you if you uh, don't have child, if you, if you have uh, childcare issues. So make sure that you are in control of what you're saying to them at all times. Um, <clears throat> and this again, <laughs> remember your audience and that social doesn't necessarily mean casual. We sort of talked about that before. Be aware of the tone of the environment. If it's casual environment, go for it. Knock yourself out. I love casual. Okay. Uh, relocation, now, that's something we've talked about. JP has talked about that to me. If you're willing to move uh, inside Europe, that's great. It's really hard to move to the U.S. right now. But I think that as the skills gap gets bigger and bigger and the U.S. gets more desperate for talent, it's going to be easier and easier because people in the U.S. are not doing as much as I think they should to stay on top of things. So if, if moving to the U.S. is something you want to do long term, of course, I am not trying to get people to leave Amsterdam, JP. Uh, <clears throat> that's a possibility. Uh, tips on networking and interviewing, I'm going to gloss over and I'll leave that for Q&A. And always make sure that you do uh, proper follow-up and thank you notes. And we've already covered, basically working with recruiters is no different than what I said earlier. That it's your responsibility, it's your career search, you should not surrender it to anyone else. And then, this is where I talk about really what's the difference. We mostly covered that. The last thing I wanted to show you is, um, this is the resume format that I recommend. And if JP won't kill me, I'll tell you the most important on th the most important thing on here is <clears throat> list your position across the uh, employment uh, across every top every job, your position, your company, the location, and the length of time you were at that company. I don't know why people put the company first. Nobody cares where you did it. That's not the primary thing. The primary thing is what you did. That's the first thing, what you did, then where you did it, then how long you did it. Those are the most important things, and it should be one line for people to read. And guess what I learned last year? I've been on, I, I'm going to have a blog coming out this week. I've been on LinkedIn for years and years. I'm one of their first uh, early adopters, and, early adapters, and um, if you look at LinkedIn, they do the exact same thing, only they do it vertically. I do it horizontally, they do it vertically. Position, company, length of employment. Very important. These are other things that I recommend. Uh, whether you want to do a chart of your projects, list your gaming experience, or whatever other experience you have. Um, references, you do not need to provide references. You don't want to provide references. You want to provide references when you're asked for them, but you want to be ready with references the minute that you might be asked for references. Always, always, always proofread, and uh, I like to leave that in there to show you that everybody screws up. You don't want that on your resume. So this is just a general find us online. And JP's going to kill me if I don't open up the floor to questions. You're fine. You're fine. All right. We're almost going to give you an headset, one of these. So you okay. Can, you can hear. Should I take this off? No, you, no, you hold that. Hold yeah. that. Okay. Just now you can hear the audience oh, asking okay. your questions. Okay. So you have two things in your hand. Great, okay. people. <laughs> question. First question right here. Are you, uh, can you hear us? Can you hear me, Mary Margaret? Yes. Yeah. All right. Here's a question for you. Uh, why shouldn't you list references unless asked for? Um, sorry, I'm putting it back to the resume. 
Well, I think references should be uh, somebody you reported to, somebody you reported to you, and a couple of your peers. And it should be three to five people. And so, one, people may be reference happy and they may call your references before you want them to. You want to be in control of that. You don't want your references worn out being answered questions about you while you're on your job search. That information is yours to control, just like everything else. The other thing is, especially if somebody is on there, unless they're your best friend and you guys are looking for jobs together, why do you want to lead them to somebody else that they can look at for the job that you're applying for? So you're saying there's a risk in references. You just want to make sure you manage it. Yeah, you, you know. don't want to over. You don't want to abuse the people who have said, "I will absolutely talk to anybody," because they, you don't really want them to talk to everybody. You want them to talk to anybody, and why give them more candidates to look at? Okay. Yeah. Anyone else here? Yeah. Let's see if this works. It seems to work. So uh, a few weeks ago, just for fun, I've decided to make a resume plus a cover letter just to see if I can get my dream job, just to learn to get feedback from. And funny enough, uh, it got passed. So soon I probably will have an interview. What are the top three things I have to think about if I go for an interview for a big company? What are the big things you have to think about? So what are the three uh, biggest mistakes I can make in this kind of interview? So I know questions are really important to ask back, uh, but what are right. the more things I can think about in this case? Have you graduated yet or are you no, still in school? I'm still a student. Okay. okay. So I think that it's important to research the company and, and not just research, go deeper. You know, find something cool that you can connect with and, and that you can mention in the interview. So I, that's a plus rather than a mistake, but, but in general, you want to show them that you're interested in the company. And you also, here's the mistake, you don't want to come off like a fan. You want to make sure that you are, uh, you're informed, you understand the company, you like the product, uh, why you connect with what they're doing, but you don't want to gush. So that's one. Two, you also want to make sure that you are, like we talked about, that you're asking them questions. Just because this may be your first job out of school, it doesn't mean that, um, that you can't ask these questions, but you do want to ask them with some humility. And honestly, I think that <laughs> I think there needs to be more humility on both sides of the interview table. Uh, I'm, I really get frustrated with companies that treat an interview like you're really lucky if you get to come work for us. And I have candidates that have, well, unless they offer me this, this, and this, and this, then I'm not going to bother. So make sure that you're open-minded and that you're ready to listen to everything. You're pleasant. You're good demeanor. Uh, don't, um, don't close yourself off to anything they have to say, basically. But don't say yes to something that isn't what you want to do. If they, if they, if your dream job, you show up for your interview and your dream job is not your dream job, or you're not really uh, qualified for that position, you want to tell them immediately. Does that help? Okay, good. Was that two or three? <laughs> good question, good question. Anyone else here? Does anyone want to work in the US of A for their dream company, their favorite game? Ah, now the hands are going up. Are you guys thinking about interning in the U.S.? Yeah? Yeah, by stage? Yeah? Nay? What's your favorite company? What company do you want to work for? Um, well, I prefer a smaller company, not a big company like uh, Nintendo or anything. Just a smaller company I can start out with uh, because, well, a big company kind of scares me. <laughs> I can understand that. Anyone else want to work for like their favorite big U.S. company? Um, I have a question. Um, how much does, especially for the games industry, does your portfolio pl uh, play a role in your resume? Can you talk louder? I'm Sorry. Um, how much of a role does your uh, portfo portfolio play in your 
resume when you send it to your uh, to a company. Are you, you an got, artist? Yeah, for games. Critical. Don't right. even waste your time sending in your resume if you're not sending in your portfolio. Right. Your portfolio needs to have your best art or your best your best work. Don't fill it with um, with things that you're not proud of just so that you have a fuller portfolio. It's better to have a smaller portfolio and show only your best work than to have a large portfolio. You want to make sure that uh, your portfolio recognizes that if anybody else did something in it, that they know what you did and they know what somebody else did so that you're not taking credit for somebody else's work whether you intend to or not. You don't want to get hired for a skill set they think you have. Uh, make sure that everything that you have in it is, um, am I telling you everything you already know? Make sure everything you have in it is uh, uh, not proprietary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you need to have some really good uh, life, uh, life, well, some, some still sketches, life, uh, art, body, as well as if you're an animator, you want to show some animation, but you need to show classic skills as well. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you need to be able to show all that. You want to be able to show different kinds of, of uh, artistic style. You don't want to just show one flavor. If you have one flavor of artistic style, then you're only going to be hired by a company that's looking for a company with that, or that's looking for somebody with that one flavor. So you want to show them the breadth of your work through from, you know, line drawings or pencil drawings or whatever, life stills to all the way to however far you go to an animator or whatever your spectacular skill set is and, <clears throat> and everything in between so that they can see the breadth of your work and the depth of your skills as an artist, whether you have a computer in front of you or not. Okay, thank you. So one more question here from D Gian. Hi, uh, thanks for the comedic relief just now. <laughs> so um, I'm a writer, and what would you recommend as uh, a type of portfolio uh, which I should use, and what kind of content would it be best for me to put on there if I want to apply for a job in the game industry? <sighs> Similar to an artist, strangely enough, you, um, unless you are only uh, interested in working in fantasy games or something like that, you want to show the breadth of your writing skills. So if you can do humor, if you can do fantasy, if you can do drama, if you can do, uh, you know, even period pieces, because we're starting to see games that, that cover everything with the serious games and educational games, and I, I didn't use the word educational, um, <laughs> and every type of game that's out there and everything that isn't a game that's out there. So if you can show that you can write in all these different areas, uh, I would have a sample of your writing. And so as many samples as you can give, make sure they're your best work, provide them with your resume, and uh, Again, if you collaborated with somebody on something, make sure that people know what you did and what the other person did. I think it's great when you collaborate, by the way, because it shows that you're able to write with a team. So I think that would be actually a great thing to add to your writing portfolio. Just make sure that they know that you collaborate with somebody on that. And also make sure that anything you've put in there isn't proprietary. Again, if you write something for somebody else, you have to make sure that you didn't just sell that to them. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I heard, I also heard that it's okay to put practices on there. So um, what I do is I experiment a lot with different styles. Oh yeah. So would you recommend that? Oh <laughs> yeah. Or? Oh yeah. If it's good. Oh yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, and you're gonna know. Yeah. Like uh, I, I do that sometimes. I've started doing that just out of boredom. Well, not boredom. I, I like to, I like to write anyway, right? So. I'll start working on a, I'll work on a post, I'll reply to somebody on Facebook, and I'll start writing like, you know, this classic drama just in, you know, s seven words, you know, I'll describe this picture, um, and it'll be this classic drama, or sometimes I'll just go off on this comedic thing, and I just do it in seven or eight lines just because it tickles me, it makes my, it, it, it makes what I'm doing more interesting, 
And of course, I want to introduce. I want to interest the person who's reading it. But at the same time, if I'm not interested in what I'm writing, what am I there for? Last question here from the room, and then we're going to wrap up for lunch. Hello, thank you first. Uh, uh, this is also a follow-up on the question of the uh, last uh, person that asked something. Um, I'm also a writer, and much of the work I've done so far has been uh, 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 contests for uh, uh, previous games. Has and been what? Contest writing. Okay. For previous games. Okay. Should I uh, add that in the resume, resumes, uh, resumes as well? Because I'm not catching all the question. Okay. So you've been writing uh, contests for previous games, so basically giving a new script for a game that already exists? Really, wedstrijden, uh, 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 contests. Contests uh, uh, that are uh, made in, inside games. I've written uh, stories or uh, uh, fan fiction uh, about the game. Based on a known IP? Based on a known game. Uh, for that game. Oh, okay. So, you know, it's kind of like... Uh, sorry like if, I am, if I'm... It's like a shadow track. It's not a real... It's not being used in a real game, but it's based on a real game. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. No, I totally get you. But what's your question behind it? Well, what should he turn that in as a part of his Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that will not scare the uh, new uh, employee uh, off, the, the new uh, uh, company where I, uh, the tr that I try to uh, Okay, work. other than me falling off the stage, why do you think it would scare them? <laughs> uh, um, because uh, I had written something for their uh, 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 competition. Thank you. <laughs> That's a compliment. Okay. That's a compliment. If you've been if you've been running a blog on uh, your favorite game company, your favorite game, and again, if you're not like just totally spilling all over the page with what a fan you are, right? And if it's genuine, really good writing, it's great. They need to see how you think, and they don't care how you got that experience. So, I mean, th yeah. Think about think about when uh, when lead designer or excuse me, level designers turn in mods, right? That's the equivalent of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. Are we awesome. done? Yes. Thank you. Ha applause. <laughs> applause. Applause. Thank you. And one more applause for the uh, salto at the end. <laughs> yeah. Great. So um, right now we're breaking for lunch. Uh, if you want to talk to Mary Margaret, she's here all day. She's um, hovering around. She's here for it now. But first, gonna get some <laughs> lunch probably. Um, uh, lunch is Roma. Lunch is back there, right? Yeah. And uh, make sure you're ready again for 1.30. It's going to be uh, the art panel right here and the blob right there. Okay. The blob is my husband. Make sure you go see it. <laughs>